I don't really know what to expect. Uh, nobody's really told me very much about what's going to happen. I think um, maybe if I was going somewhere in England or somewhere in the States, there'd be some type of orientation uh, pamphlet or, you know, pages of information, but it's nothing like that. I'm kind of a nomadic soul, I guess. I've worn a lot of different hats in my life, and I love to travel and learn new things. I've been a scenic designer in New York, worked in product development in China, managed a small tea company in rural Connecticut, and freelanced as an interior designer in Hawaii. But it was really tea that led me back to ceramics because the two are so closely connected. My name is Suzanne Wang, and I'm from the Big Island of Hawaii. I live in the Hamakua Coast in a little village called Wailea, and I'm here in Japan to do a one-year apprenticeship with Ken Matsuzaki. When I first saw him hand-building at a workshop in Hawaii, I was blown away by how quickly and gracefully he could create shapes. I was immediately inspired, and I wanted to learn more from him. I also genuinely liked him as a person, and I think that's really important when you're looking for a teacher. I asked whether I could study under him for a few months, and he said that wasn't enough time to learn anything. One year would be the minimum, he said, and I eventually agreed to commit to that. ということを求めてないし、彼女がそれをずっとこれから先焼き物を続けていく気持ちとかスタミナがその彼女についてくれればいいと思う。To study under Ken Matsuzaki for a year in Japan really feels like a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. But a few months ago my father was diagnosed with colon cancer. Can you clean the fish? So it's been kind of a crazy emotional roller coaster ride. We embarked on this journey to try yes. to change his diet and lifestyle and approach this cancer as an opportunity to live a new life. That's been really um, challenging, but we've all learned so much in the process. He came to visit me for a month in Hawaii and he gave me his blessing to go to Japan. But of course, it feels like there's a shadow hanging over me. It's somewhat difficult leaving my family behind to go to another country for so long when my dad's health is so uncertain. I think the biggest thing that I'm going to get out of this apprenticeship is to really understand on a deeper level what it means to be a potter. It's a whole lifestyle. Being in the present moment and being totally dedicated to the craft, you just have to live it. And that's what he's trying to show me, to build up my discipline and find out if this is really for me. Um, it's really hard work, that's, that's the journey. We do a lot of uh, weeding. <laughs> We spend the first half hour to an hour every day just taking care of the grounds. We deal with a lot of wood, stacking wood, splitting wood, bundling it, unbundling it, you know. 1,500 bundles went into the firing this time. I live in a tiny 300 square foot studio in the center of Old Mashiko town, close to the train station. It's really the perfect size because I'm only here in the evenings. And I came with very little, just, you know, a few books, my laptop, and clothes. I was prepared to live an aesthetic life for one year in full pottery immersion. And it's pretty much been just that. Mashiko is about 100 kilometers from Tokyo, and it has a population of 27,000 people. But there are 400 potters who live and work here. Mashiko was established as a ceramics town by the great potter Shoji Hamada. Hamada's apprentice was later Ken Matsuzaki's sensei. So Ken is really central to Mashiko pottery. On the surface, this town is very, very quiet, but there's a lot of creative energy once you know where to look. I'm the first 
female apprentice he's ever had. And technically, he's had one foreign apprentice before. That guy lasted only three days and then disappeared. What's unique about Sensei is that he doesn't allow his apprentices to do his work. Usually, apprentices will throw or build pottery. All the hand building and throwing, he does himself. But there's so much to do to prepare for that. We have to prepare the clay, wedge, roll coils, clean up all his tools, keep the studio tidy. Our sensei kind of is like a surgeon. He walks into the room and everything has to be prepared for him so that he doesn't have to think of any of that stuff. All he has to do is pick up the piece of clay and just start. His main apprentice has been with him for five years. His name's Doi. He's one of the hardest working men that I've ever met. It's been really inspiring and jaw-dropping to see what Doi does. Doi is extremely shy and reserved. I think that most of the time he just wants to be alone. I was warned before I came here that I should not ask any questions, keep a physical distance from my sensei, and I had to be completely obedient. I was always kind of rebellious when I was younger, so I always had problems with authority. <laughs> it's not like I can't ask questions, it's just knowing when to ask them. Does Doi ever ask questions? Mm, Doi rarely asks questions. In this kiln, there are two chambers behind the firebox. So the firebox behaves more like an anagama firing, where a lot of wood is loaded into this front part of the kiln, and there's a lot of ash glaze effect that will happen. The first chamber is for his shino wear. Those pieces have been glazed. That chamber gets the charcoal put into it on the last day of the firing. There'll be a lot of carbon and a lot of effects that happen that is really different from the other chambers. で、炭を使う理由というのは、普通に灰被ったものに対して、その灰をあの釜の中で変化させる。これは炭の炭素を使って炭化させていくんですけど、その炭化させながらまたあのあの薪の炎でその with the Nobarigama firing, it takes months of preparation to load this kiln with about four to 500 pieces of pottery. He's very meticulous about how he loads. So we have diagrams and charts and everything is plotted out. And then once we start firing, there are two man crews, 24 seven for seven days. We'll work an eight to nine hour shift and every five minutes we're stoking different parts of the kiln. You have to be totally focused, watch the flame constantly to make sure that it's in reduction. So when the flame starts to go down and the temperature starts to drop, we have to stoke. It was so exciting, you know, I, it felt like the kiln came alive. And this fire was so intense, it gets to about 2,000 degrees inside. And so every time you open up a hole to stoke, you're just blasted with hot air. And we're, we're drenched in sweat for like eight hours straight for each shift. It's just incredibly hot. But at the same time, fire is this energy. You know, you're communicating with it. There's a collaboration between the fire, the wood, and the artist. It kind of felt like a purifying experience. What's it going to be like to open this kiln? It's going to be like Christmas. Just can't wait to crack that thing open and see what happened. Because I've been so involved through the whole process of making and prepping and loading. There's so much that was invested, so much time and energy invested in this firing. So it means a lot to the apprentices. When you open a kiln, it's a really personal experience. And it can be really intense and 
anxiety producing because you're seeing what you made for the first time. There'll be some failures, there'll be some treasure, some amazing surprises. えっとね、その、あの、若い頃は非常にナーバスになったり、緊張したり、構わせするまでイライラしたりしてたんだけど、今はもう自然に構わに任せてずっと待ってられる。だから非常にその自然体でいられる。well, that's what's so interesting about pottery in general, is that there's so much structure and planning. You don't get immediate results like you do in painting or drawing. Pottery is, is several steps to the end result. But the final process, the firing, is when the artist has to just let go of the control because something else happens. Chemistry happens, the elements take over. You can put hard work and your love into it, but you'll never be able to control the outcome completely. I just have to trust that whatever happens, even if it's not perfect or what I had in mind, the results can still be very interesting and beautiful. <laughs> 